Hi everyone, so today we're going to be starting chapter four, um, which is going to continue this trend towards no longer learning about new derivative rules or new methods of taking derivatives and more now towards applications of derivatives. So, you know, how can we take all the stuff that we've learned so far this quarter and actually apply it to different types of situations? So today we're going to be talking about something called local and absolute extrema, which as I wrote it out, I realized sounds pretty intense. Um, but basically this word extrema, it's just a word that encompasses both um, maxima, so meaning maxima is the plural of maximum, and minima, which is the plural of minimum. So the word extrema just basically means both maximums and minimums. And so we'll, we'll get more into the specifics of that, but I just wanted to kind of point out because I know that's kind of perhaps an unfamiliar word. Um, so yeah, so basically today we're gonna start by talking about local maxima and minima and how those relate to derivatives. And then we'll also talk about something called absolute maxima and minima. Um, and today's video is gonna be kind of an introduction to some of these ideas. So a lot of this stuff we're gonna get more into next week actually. So, you know, it's not gonna get super deep into it um, just yet. Okay, so first thing I wanna talk about are local maxima and minima. So this is something that if you um, took pre-calculus here at North, you should have learned this in your Math 141 class. Um, so basically, uh, a local maximum or minimum is, is just kind of a peak or a valley in your graph. So if you have a function that kind of goes up a little and then goes back down, that little hill that it creates is what's called a local maximum. And if it goes down a little and comes back up, that little valley that it creates is what's called a local minimum. So I'll write those both down as kind of definitions. Um, so a local maximum is a point on a function that is higher than the points around it. And I know that's not a super technical definition. Basically, in order to make it make this definition technical, you, you have to get pretty technical. So this is kind of gonna be our working definition. So basically, when you have a point in your graph that if you look to the left and the right of it, it's the highest point in that little area, that's what's called a local maximum. So a local maximum um, basically looks like a hill or a peak in your, in your graph. So I'll just put that in parentheses. So it looks like a peak or a hill in your graph. So I'll sketch an example in a second. I just wanna write down the definition of a local minimum so similarly, a local minimum is a point on a function that is lower than the points around it. And so a local minimum in your graph um, looks like a valley or like a, a dip in the graph. So why are we using the word local here? It's basically because um, local maxima and minima, so th by the way, as I mentioned earlier, the, the plural of maximum is maxima and the plural of minimum is minima. You might also hear me say maximums and minimums because sometimes I forget and I just misspeak. Um, and then we also might use max and min as abbreviations. Um, so why, why local? Well, because local maxima and local minima are not necessarily the highest point in the graph overall. So for example, let me just sketch a, a function here. So let's say you have a function that kind of goes up like this, down, and then goes back up and it continues this way and that way. So this point here would be considered a local maximum 
Notice it's definitely not the highest point in the entire graph, right? Because the graph kind of keeps going up that way. Um, so that's why the word local is there. It basically means that even though it's not the highest point in the whole graph, it's the highest point in like that part of the graph, right? So there, there's kind of a, if you were to zoom in, it would look like it's the highest point. And then similarly, this point here is not the lowest point in the entire graph, but it is locally, you know, in that local region, it is the lowest point. So I have an example of a function down here with a whole bunch of different peaks and valleys going on. So I want you to, to look at this graph for a minute and you know maybe pause the video and think about, so identify where you think all the local maxima and minima are in this graph. So all the peaks and valleys, all the points that are higher or lower than the points around them. And then I also want you to think about what is going on with the derivative at those points. So if you were to take the derivative at one of the points where you have a local max or a local min, what would the derivative be? So just think about that for a minute. So let's circle all the, the local maxima and minima uh, in this graph. So we have a local maximum here. Um, we have a local maximum here and we have a local maximum here. So the, the things that are in green are our local maxima. And then we down here, um, down here, and down here, those are our local minima. So what's going on with the um, the derivatives? Well, let's let's take a look. Let's let's kind of go from left to right. So if you were to try to figure out the slope of the tangent line at this point, what would happen? So this is a, a situation we talked about a while back when we first started talking about derivatives. Um, if you have a part of your graph that is like pointy, the derivative is undefined. So the derivative at this particular point, if you tried to evaluate it, would actually not exist. What about at this point? Well, this is no longer a pointy, sharp part of the graph, right? So this would have a horizontal tangent line. And then what about this one down here? Well, that would also have a horizontal tangent line. And this would also have a horizontal tangent line. And this would have a horizontal tangent line. And then this last one would have a tangent line that's undefined, right? There's no clear one tangent line to draw and that means the derivative is undefined. So my point here is that every single place in the graph where there's a local max or a local min either has a derivative of zero or has a derivative that's undefined. So one thing before, I'm gonna kind of write that down, but there, there's one other thing that, that we should say here, which is, so I, I said in my definition that um, the local maxima and local minima are the points. That's technically not true, so there, there's a slight distinction. Um, so if you were to, like for example, let's say you wanted to talk about this point here. So really like the correct way um, of describing so correct description. If you have a local max or a local min, if you just say the point, you know, we'll, we'll know what you're talking about, but the, really the like correct way to say it would be to say that there is a local maximum of three, because that's the y value. Sorry, I'm just trying to scroll right, okay. At x is equal to, and I picked kind of a bad example because the x and the y values are the same. But my point here is that um, the actual maximum is the y value, and then you kind of separately say um, the x value. So whenever you're talking about the, the maximum or the minimum itself, you're giving the y value, and then you kind of describe like where that local max or min happens by saying, oh, it's at x is equal to something. So that's, it's almost like, gram like a grammatical thing. Like that's just kind of the, the technically correct way to refer to these things. And if you're curious, like why, you know, why are we saying at x equals three, why don't we just say the maximum is x equals three? Well, think about like, imagine that this graph represented um, temperature as a function of time. So 
you wouldn't say, oh, the maximum temperature was five hours, right? That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to say the maximum temperature was five hours. It makes sense to say the maximum temperature was 30 degrees at five hours. So the outputs are really the maximum um, and minimum values, and then the X values are just kind of locations of where those are happening. It's not like a super duper important distinction, but that's how I will from here on out be referring to local maxima and minima. And I think on your homework, it will kind of expect the same type of format. Okay, so now that we have this sort of better way of describing them in place, I can say something else here, which is um, notice that if um, this function f of x has a local max or min at an x value x is equal to c, then either f prime of c is equal to zero or f prime of c does not exist. I hope I'm not going off screen here. Right, every single point where we had a hill or a valley, either we had a horizontal tangent line or we didn't have any tangent line. So we say the derivative doesn't exist. So that's gonna become a really important fact. That's, that's kind of how, so what we're gonna be doing next is, here I handed you the graph and I said, find the local maxima and minima just by kind of looking at it. Now what we're gonna be doing is without knowing what the graph looks like, we're gonna to try to come up with what the local maxima and minima are just by using the derivative. And so we're really gonna be using this fact here that we just kind of observed in this example. So there's a name for these types of points, um, the, the points where the derivative is either zero or uh, like undefined. Um, so those points are gonna be called critical points. So let me write that down. So if um, f of x, is a function and um, f prime of c is either undefined or equal to zero. Um, then we say that f of x has a critical point. at x is equal to c. So the, any place where the derivative is either zero or undefined is called a critical point, or sometimes it's called a critical value. And I always kind of mix up which one, sorry, let me change this. I'm gonna call it actually a critical number. I just looked at my notes and I was like, okay. I wanna be consistent with what I think your book uses. And I kind of like that better because we're not really talking about a point, we're just talking about the x value. So the x value is called a critical number. So the other important fact, and this is basically, I'm gonna say what we wrote down above again, because it's true for any function. So for any function, um, if x is equal to c, or let me, let me say it this way. Um, if f of x has a, local max or min at x equals c, then x equals c is a critical number. So every critical point, or sorry, every local max or min is, is going to correspond to being a critical number because Anytime, basically if you just think about like if you have a peak or a valley, the only way that can happen is if you have a horizontal tangent line or if it's pointy, then, then you will have an undefined tangent line. So it's, it's important to realize though that, that the opposite is not true. So notice the way this is phrased. It says, if you have a local max or min, then there's a critical number. So it's not true and I'll write this down and then we'll, we'll look at an example of, of why we can say this above. Um, so however, it is not true that 
every critical number. corresponds to a local max or min. And so why is that? Well, basically it's possible for the, um, for the graph to flatten out and have a horizontal tangent line without having a local max or min. So if we look at the example up here, and maybe let me circle this in a different color. So here, we have a place where the derivative is equal to zero, right? If you were to take the derivative and, and sketch the tangent line at x is equal to five, you would see that it would, had a slope of zero. However, that's not a hill or a valley, right? That's not a local max or min. So that's kind of an exception to show that this is a place where we have a critical number, but not a local max or min. So basically the way I would think about it is that when you find the critical numbers, that gives you a list of potential local maxima and minima. And then, and, and for, for today, we're just gonna be checking whether they actually are local maxima or minima by graphing, by like just pulling up the graph in Desmos. Um, next week, we'll learn how you can actually just use calculus or other methods to figure out whether they're local maxima or minima. So one more thing I'm gonna write down. I know this has been a lot of just like, laying out definitions, I promise we'll get to some actual concrete examples really soon. Um, so one, one thing that we, or that I just wanted to, to say here to kind of summarize is that, um, so finding all critical numbers of f of x, gives you a list of all potential um, local maxima and minima. They're not guaranteed to be local maxima or minima, but, but they're all the potential ones. You can't have a local max or min that, that isn't a critical number. You're not gonna miss any of them, but you might find more than you need. You might be casting too wide of a net. Okay, so let's get into some actual examples. So we are going to do a couple examples, I think three examples. Um, and so for each of these examples, we're going to find all the local ma or all of the critical numbers, and then we'll look at the graph to kind of confirm whether those uh, critical numbers are actually local maxima and minima or not. So we're gonna find all critical numbers of the function f of x is equal to um, 2x cubed minus 3x squared minus 12x. Okay, so how do you find the critical numbers? You basically just take the derivative and set it equal to zero and solve. And then you also want to look for are there any places where the derivative is undefined. So we're basically looking for what makes the derivative zero and what makes it undefined. So first thing is, is taking the derivative. So in this case, we get um, 6x squared minus 6x minus 12. So this is a polynomial, right? It's a, it's a quadratic function. So it's, there's nothing that would make this undefined. And we'll see an example um, in a few minutes that, that is undefined. But basically, you're, uh, you know, a function will only be undefined if, for example, like you're you have a, a denominator that could be zero or something along those lines or a square root, things that, that can be undefined. But here, nothing can go wrong. So n there's no x values that make this undefined. So we want to focus on figuring out what makes it zero. So we can divide everything by six, right? And we would get x squared minus x minus two is equal to zero. And then this factors as x minus two and x plus one. And so that tells us that x equals two and x equals negative one are our two critical numbers. So those are the places where we have a horizontal tangent line and maybe we have a local max or min. So let's go look at the graph and see what it actually looks like. So here is our function. 
And let me actually make this um, bold so we can see it a little better. Oh. Okay, so let's look at, uh, so we found the critical numbers to be two and negative one. So let's start with negative one. So at x is equal to negative one, we can see that we do have a peak. So we have a, um, a local max at x is equal to negative one. And then if we look at x is equal to two, we see that we have a valley. So that's a local min. So I'll put that on here, but I just wanna make sure when you, if you look back at this, you realize that the only way we determined that was looking at the graph. So we saw that there was a, um, a local max at negative one, and there was a local min at two. So like I said, later next week, we'll get into how you can actually figure out that without looking at the graph, but for now, we're just gonna be doing it by looking at the graph. Okay, so another example. Um, so let's find all critical numbers of um, g of x is equal to sine of x plus one. So again, first thing we wanna do is take the derivative. And then we're gonna be looking at where is the derivative equal to zero and where is the derivative undefined. So first of all, again, just like in the last one, um, a trigonometric function has a domain of all real numbers. So there's, there's nothing that can make this undefined. So we don't need to worry about that aspect of it. And honestly, for the most part, when we're dealing with critical numbers, most of the time you're gonna be focusing on where is the derivative zero, not where is it undefined. But, but we'll see in a moment that there are some examples where it's undefined. So where is this equal to zero? Well, this question I think is best answered by just looking at the unit circle and just like visually looking at where are the angles where cosine is equal to zero. So cosine is equal to zero whenever the x coordinate of the point on the unit circle is zero. So one angle that would work would be pi over two. So this would be the point zero one. And then another angle that would work would be three pi over two. So that would be zero negative one. And basically the, the way that you can describe, oh, things are freaking out here. Um, the way you can describe these two solutions is you can say x is equal to um, pi over two plus two pi k. So if you think back to, um, to pre-calculus, remember this plus two pi k thing basically just means that not only do you have these two angles, but you also have any other angles that are coterminal with them. So for example, so this angle here would be pi over two, right? If you just go straight up to, to 90 degrees. If you were to instead go all the way around in a circle and then come back to that angle, that would be two pi plus pi over two. And if you were to go all the way around the circle again, that would be four pi plus pi over two and so on and so forth. So you, anytime you have an angle that is a solution to an, a, a trig equation like this, you can kind of just tack on two pi k. Um, and then in this case, there's actually a, a slightly nicer way to write your solution. So because these two solutions are pi away from each other, right? If you took pi over two and you added pi to it, you would get three pi over two. And so really there, there's a, a more concise way to, to write these two answers. So this one is kind of redundant. And instead what we can write is um, just x is equal to pi over two plus pi times k. Because basically anything that is, um, so you have pi over two and then if you add pi to that, that gives you, like we said, three pi over two. If you add pi to that, that brings you to an angle that's coterminal with pi over two, add pi to that, that brings you to an angle that's coterminal with three pi over two, and so on. Um, and by the way, and I, I, not, I swear I'm not trying to constantly plug my own YouTube channel, but um, we're, we're right now covering solving trig equations in my 142 class. So if this is something that you're really rusty on, I would definitely recommend checking out um, the videos in my channel right now uh, for 142. Um, okay, so we just figured out that, that the derivative is equal to zero at any point that is any x value that's pi over two plus some multiple of pi. So looking at our graph here, 
So we can see that our first local max is at pi over two. Then we have a local min at three pi over two. Then we have a local max at five pi over two. We have a local min at seven pi over two and so on and so forth. So they're basically kind of alternating. Um, so I guess, how should I summarize that there? Maybe let's say we have um, local maxima at, and now I forget whether it's even or odd multiples. So let's see, so we have the local maxima at the, um, at pi over two, five pi over two, et cetera. And we have local minima at um, three pi over two, seven pi over two, et cetera. All right, so one more example. And as promised, this one's gonna bring in something a little bit different. So we're gonna find the critical numbers of the function um, h of x is equal to x minus one to the two thirds. So again, we wanna start by taking the derivative and um, how does the derivative work here? Well, this is a chain rule, but it's, it's one of those kind of nice chain rules where the derivative of the inside function is just one, right? So we, we did some examples back with the chain rule where like if you do, for example, the square root of x plus one, or um, i trying to remember what else we did, things like um, e to the x minus five, you know, anything where the inside function, the derivative is just one, it's, it's a chain rule, but, but you don't really see the inside part of the chain rule happening. So in this case, we would just bring down the two thirds and then we would have x minus one, and then we need to subtract one from the exponent. So two thirds minus one is gonna give us negative one third. And so maybe a slightly nicer way of writing this would be um, two over three times x minus one to the one third. Okay, so first question is, um, what would make this undefined? And so now we actually do have something that would make this undefined. So where is the fraction undefined? It's undefined when the denominator is zero. So this is undefined at x is equal to one, because if you were to plug in one here, you would get one minus one, which is zero. Um, you would also probably want to think about this. So in this case, oops, in this case, it's a cube root and there's actually no numbers that you can't take the cube root of, right? You can take the cube root of a negative number. You can take the cube root of zero. There are no numbers that you're not allowed to take cube root of, but if it was a square root, then you would need to think, oh wait, are there any negative numbers? Um, any numbers that would make me, force me to take the square root of a negative number. Okay, so our function is undefined at x is equal to one. So that is for sure one of our critical numbers. What about setting it equal to zero? So if we try to set two over three times x minus one to the one third equal to zero, so that's never gonna equal zero. There, there's no solutions to this equation. And so why is that? It's basically because a fraction can only be zero when the numerator is zero, and the numerator here is two. So this is never gonna be zero. So this part has no solutions. And that's okay, that doesn't mean there's no critical number. That just means that the only critical number is the one that comes from the function being undefined. So let me pull up the, the graph of this thing and we can see what's going on. So this has that kind of thing that we talked about a while back called a cusp. So the graph is, um, you know, it's sharp, it has like a sharp point to it. And in this case, it is a local min. So this is a, a, an example, and there aren't, like I said, that many, but this is one example of, um, of a function that has a local min or a local max at a place where it's uh, undefined, where the derivative is undefined. Okay, so on your worksheet, there'll be some more examples like the ones that we just did. And I, I would definitely recommend doing them because I think each of them brings up something a little bit different um, in terms of you know, how it plays out with the, the critical numbers and whether they're local maxima or minima or not. So definitely do those and definitely look at the graphs. I think it's really important to get that connection between looking at the graph and, and doing the, you know, the algebra and the calculus.
Okay, so there's another topic that I wanna get into, and um, this video is probably gonna be a little bit longer than some of them have been recently, um, because there's kind of two parts to it. So if you wanna kind of take a break here and, and just focus on this stuff first, by all means you can do that. Um, but we're now gonna get into something called uh, absolute maxima and minima. And, okay, let me scroll up. So, so far we've been talking about um, the local maxima and minima. So local maxima and minima, they could be the highest point in the graph, but they're not necessarily the highest point in the graph. All that really matters is that they're a peak or a valley. It's, it's not so much about how they compare to the graph as a whole, as it is just a kind of a description of a shape, a, a peak or a valley. So now we're gonna be talking about um, absolute maxima and minima. So specifically, we're gonna be talking about um, the absolute maxima and minima of a function on an interval. So, so in general, what does it mean to find an absolute maximum or minimum? It kind of means what it sounds like. It means what is the very highest or very lowest point on the graph. However, not all points have a highest or lowest point. So like just to give a quick example, to go back to, to this one, this point does not actually have a highest value, right? It kind of keeps going up and up and up. So it, it wouldn't really make sense to talk about the, the absolute maximum of this function. So what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna restrict to always talking about just an interval, just a portion of your graph. Because if you're talking about just a portion of your graph, then there will be an absolute highest or lowest point. So the absolute maximum of a function f of x on an interval from a to b is the very highest um, y value or output value, maybe I'll just say, actually I'll say it this way, the very highest value f of x reaches for um, values of x that are between a and b. And then similarly, the absolute minimum of a function on an interval is the very lowest value f of x reaches um, when x is between a and b. So you're really in these problems focusing just on a, a certain snippet of the graph, not on the graph as a whole. So I wanna look at a couple of examples just visually to kind of, similar to the last one, to give us an idea of what we're gonna be looking for. Um, and then we'll do some examples where, kind of like the ones we just did, where we don't know what the graph looks like and we're just kind of using derivatives to help us. Okay, so I wanna focus on these two graphs and specifically on finding the, the absolute max and min on the interval from one to three. So let me, I'll say it this way. Absolute max on the interval from one to three. So we're looking at what's the very highest y value this, this function reaches. And in this case, the highest y value is um, four, right? When, when x is equal to three, this reaches a height of four. And what is the absolute min on this interval, well, it's one because that's the very lowest point that this graph reaches um, on the interval from one to three. And you know, there's other parts of the graph outside, but we're just looking between one and three. And then for g of x, for this one, we see that the absolute max on the interval from one to three is um, three, right? We have this point here. That's the very highest point that this graph reaches between x is equal to one and x is equal to three. 
So our absolute max in this case is three. And then our absolute min in this case is zero because that's the y value, the lowest y value it reaches. So what I wanted to show you in this example is that when you're looking for an absolute max or min on an interval, sometimes those absolute maxes and or maxima and minima happen at the end points. So these examples show that, so for these functions, Um, the local, or sorry, the absolute um, max and min occur at the endpoints of the interval. Right, because the, the blue one, f of x, is going up the whole time. So the lowest point is at the left end point and the highest point is at the right end point, whereas the green one's going down. So it starts at, at the, the highest value and then it kind of goes down the whole time. So that's kind of one scenario you can have. You can have a, a situation like this where because the function is either going up or going down from left to right, the, the absolute maximum happen on one of the two ends of the interval that you're focusing on. However, you can also have situations where that is not the case. So for example, um, let's try to figure out, let's start with, I guess, h of x. So for h of x, um, the absolute, and I get a little lazy with this, so I'm just gonna abbreviate it as abs. So the absolute maximum on the interval from one to three. So in this case, the absolute maximum, um, so here it is, right, it's, it's four. And notice that that absolute maximum did not occur at an endpoint. It actually occurred in the middle of the interval. And then um, in this case, the absolute min on 1, 3 um, happened actually at an endpoint. So the, the max happened in the middle. The min happened at an endpoint. And then for k of x, the absolute max. Um, again, in this case, absolute maximum uh, happens at an endpoint, and I guess I didn't denote the point here, but it's three. Oops, I forgot to write the interval. And then, but then the absolute minimum is zero, and that one happened, again, in the middle of the interval. So what's my point with this example? Well, it's that the, the highest and lowest value on the interval, they don't have to happen at the endpoints. They can also happen in the middle, but what, what's going on here? Like, what's special about this point and this point? I would pause it and try to think about it. Think about how this relates to what we were talking about earlier in the video. So what's special about those points? Well, they're local maxima and minima, or they're, they're critical numbers. So one situation you can have is you can have an absolute max or min happen at the endpoints, like in the top picture, but you can also have a, an example where, um, so for these functions, um, absolute maxima, and minima also occur at critical numbers um, in the middle of the interval, so not at the endpoints. Okay, so what does this all tell us? What, what can we kind of summarize here? Um, well, if you're trying to find the absolute maximum value of a function on an interval, there's really only a few things you have to try. You have to try the endpoints and you have to try critical numbers, and that's it. You, you basically can just test out what happens at those particular values of the function and use that to, to determine what the absolute max and absolute min are. So let me summarize that here. So finding the absolute max and min. 
of a function on an interval. So the first thing you want to do is you want to find all the critical numbers. And specifically, um, you want to make sure that you're finding critical numbers that lie within the interval you're focusing on. So if you find like a, for example, if you were working with these functions and you found that they had a critical number at x is equal to 5, well, that's not the interval we're focusing on. So, so it's really only the, the critical numbers that fall within the range of x values that you're focusing on. Um, that fall in the interval from a to b. And if one of them happens to also be an endpoint, that's, that's fine. It doesn't really matter. Um, you're just kind of finding the critical numbers. You're not even worrying about whether they're local maxima or minima. You're just finding them. Um, then you want to um, plug your critical numbers into f of x. Then you also want to plug your endpoints, so a and b, into f of x. And so you're going to kind of have this list of what did you get when you plugged in the critical numbers, what did you get when you plugged in the endpoints, and then you just compare them. And whichever is your largest result, so the largest result from steps two and three is the absolute max. The smallest result, so why does this work? Um, basically, it's because it's, it's just not possible for you to have an absolute max or min that doesn't, that isn't either a, um, an endpoint or a critical number, right? Because if, if your functions look like the ones in blue and green, it's going to be an endpoint. If the function happens to go up and come back down, well, then it's going to have a critical number because it's going to have kind of a peak or a valley. So just kind of thinking about the shapes of these functions, it really only makes sense that the endpoints or a critical number could be um, the absolute max or min. So those are the only things you need to try. Okay, so last thing we're going to do in this video is just a few examples of actually um, finding the absolute max and min uh, of functions. So we're going to do two examples. So first example is going to be, um, we're going to find the absolute max and min of um, f of x is equal to x cubed minus 3x squared minus 1 on the interval from 0 to 4. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is find the critical numbers. So f prime of x in this case is equal to 3x squared um, minus 6x. And so again, it's a polynomial. It's never going to be undefined. So we just focus on setting it equal to 0. So in this case, we can factor out a 3x from both parts. And so we're left with x minus 2. And that tells us that either 3x equals 0, which would give us x is equal to 0, um, and then the other critical number would be x is equal to 2. So those are our two critical numbers. So now what we want to do is basically plug in our critical numbers, plug in our endpoints, and just kind of compare what we get for each, um, for each thing. And so as I mentioned, it's okay, like here, notice that this is a critical number and it's also an endpoint. That doesn't really matter. It really doesn't make a difference um, because you're not really caring about what these things are. You're just comparing them. You're just plugging them all into your function and just seeing what numbers you get. So we can plug in our, um, our critical numbers. So we do f of 0 
and make sure, by the way, that you're plugging them into your original function. So why are we plugging them into our original function? Well, we already know that if you plug them into the derivative, you get zero, right? That was kind of the whole point. Um, and so the point is we're plugging them into the function to see what are the y values we get. What's going on at this point? Is this point higher than, than all the other points? So if you plug zero into this function, you get, and sorry, I just realized looking at my notes that this was supposed to be a plus one. It didn't make a difference in our derivative, but it will make a difference here. So when we plug in zero, you'll get one. And then if we plug in two, so I know this video is getting pretty long, so I'm not gonna bore you. Sorry, I'm having trouble getting the video to the screen to scroll. There we go. Um, so I won't bore you with actually going through that arithmetic, but if you plug in two, you get um, negative three. Feel free to confirm that for yourself. And then the, the, the next step we were gonna do is we we're gonna plug in the endpoints. So we already plugged in zero, right? Because that happened to also be a critical number. So now we just need to plug in four. And again, if you plug that in, I happen to know that that was gonna give you 17. So the last step is basically just to kind of compare what you got here and whatever's your highest point so this is our highest y value that we get, right? So that tells us that we have an absolute max of 17. So that's the highest y value we get. And we get that value at x is equal to four. And then we look for what's the very lowest value and that was this one. And so that tells us we have an absolute minimum value and that happens at um, x is equal to two. So let's take a peek at this graph real quick. Um, so it's here. So this is, the <clears throat> this is the original function, and I'm just gonna actually make it so that only the, the part of the graph we're focusing on shows, So, or I'll highlight it. So here the part in green is the interval from zero to four. So what we can see is that our local max, or sorry, our absolute max happened at four because that part of the function just kind of keeps going up and up and up. Our absolute minimum happened at two. And that was because um, the graph dipped low down enough there and it had a, a local minimum that also happened to be the very lowest value in the graph. Okay, one more example. I don't know what's wrong with my screen. It just doesn't wanna scroll down. So last example is we're going to find the uh, absolute maximum and minimum of um, g of x is equal to x minus um, 2 sine of x. And we're looking on the interval from um, 0 to 2 pi. So first step again is to find the critical numbers. So we're gonna take the derivative. So in this case, we get one minus two times cosine of x. Again, it's a trig function. There's nothing really that will go wrong with it. So we really just wanna focus on figuring out where is that equal to zero. So um, we can solve this by uh, adding two times cosine of x to both sides, right? We get, I'm gonna kind of flip the order. That would be equivalent to two times cosine of x is equal to one, right? If we added cosine of x to both sides and then just switch the, the order that we wrote it in. Um, and then we can divide both sides by two. So we get cosine of x is equal to one half. And so that means we're looking for the angles where the x coordinate on the unit circle, oops, is equal to one half. So that would be an angle of pi over six so that would be the point on the unit circle where we have an x coordinate of one half and a y coordinate of square root of three over two. So this is pi over six, or sorry, pi over three. Um, so that's one possibility. And then the other possibility would be um, at this angle, right? This is also an x value of one half because it's symmetric. And so this angle would be, um, let's see, five pi over three. 
And how did I figure that out? Well, six pi over three would be two pi, right? Six pi over three is the same as two pi, and so five pi over three is just pi over three less. And so we don't need to say plus two pi k or anything here, right? Because we're only looking for answers that are between zero and two pi. So we don't care about anything except for what's between zero and two pi. Okay, so next step is we're gonna plug in into our original function, we're gonna plug in those values. So I'm gonna, again, save you the time and I'm just gonna plug these numbers in for you, or I, I already did, and I'll just write them down here. So if you plug in um, pi over three, you get approximately 0 0.685. And the reason I'm putting them as decimals and not in exact form is because we really wanna be able to easily compare what's bigger and what's smaller, and that's gonna be a lot easier with a decimal approximation than if we had it um, in exact form. So if we plug in five pi over three, and again, we're, we're plugging this into our original function, right? We're plugging it into this function. So if you plug in five pi over three, you should get um, approximately 6.968. And then next we have to do the endpoints. So the endpoints for this interval are zero and two pi. So if you plug in zero, you should get zero. Our function was um, zero minus two sine of x, so zero minus zero is zero. And then if you plug in two pi, you get actually two pi, so that's approximately 6.283. All right, so now we can just kind of compare what we, what we got here, and we see that the very highest value we get is this one. And so that tells us that our absolute maximum is um, approximately 6.968, and that occurs at x is equal to five pi over three. And then our very lowest value was this one. So that was an absolute minimum of approximately negative 0.685, and that occurred at x is equal to pi over three. And again, let's just look at the graph to kind of confirm this for ourselves. So here is the function, the original function, kind of an interesting function. Um, and then here is highlighted in green, the portion that we're actually interested in. So that's from zero to two pi. And so we can see that the very lowest, oops, the very lowest value happens at pi over three. So that's, that's what we saw. It looks like it's one, but it's a little past one. And then the very highest value also happens at a local max, so at, or at a, a critical number. And so at five pi over three, that's where we have our highest point. So yeah, so the whole point is basically just, again, recognizing that, um, that places where the derivative is zero, they give us potential peaks and valleys, and those potential peaks and valleys could also be actually the very highest point in your graph. It really just depends on the shape of the graph. Um, but here you can see how you can start to, to use derivatives to kind of get a sense of, of how graphs are shaped. And that's really what we're going to be focusing on next week. Um, and then in today's worksheet, I also give you an example of kind of a, a real world situation where you can see how finding, using derivatives to find um, maxima and minima can actually be used to answer real world problems. All right, I will see you next time.